Lucky you. 36 Turn pistols and golf. Alternate Shots Podcast. Barney's Army. Where we talk about golf. Sandy. Poker. James Bond. Horse racing. Double. Classic movies. Zenyatta. We have no script. Down the stretch they come. We are glad you joined us. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> so folks out there for the Alternate Shots Podcast, we have a little special edition here, a little off the beaten path with... Our friend, Doug Frazier, who's everything golf, just about everything gambling that's either illegal or legal. He was a caddy like uh, some of us. Raise my hand. He was a superintendent. I was never a superintendent, but Billy and I have the utmost respect for superintendents because they make golf courses like this one, your golf course, so beautiful. Welcome to the podcast, Doug. Yeah, yeah. thanks for having me, uh, Billy and Bob, and it's and it's my pleasure. Um, that was just a couple jobs I've done in the business. There's quite a few on top of that over my long and somewhat suspect career. <laughs> of all the jobs, just before we get off that topic, that you've done in your career in golf, and they said you could do one over again, which would be the one you'd do again as a, as a remake? Uh, I've, I've built five golf courses. I probably would be would be one or two or would do some remodels and some changes. Um, but the thing I probably like the most of the golf is I love the kitchen and the food and beverage the most. Back on so building the golf courses, I'm building the golf courses. What's the biggest challenge, obviously, other than moving all that dirt? But for, for someone who's built the golf course, Billy and I haven't done that. We've seen it happen. And we've seen him rebuild Wingfoot. What's the biggest mm -hmm. challenge? I'm going to tell you something that nobody talks about. Proper drainage. You have to move the water. It, it, move the water means moving the water properly uh, means good turf grass. And I don't think um, I've made that mistake, not putting enough drainage in. Of course, I built in Florida. I went back after it was 90% done and spent another 300000 on drainage. Best money I ever spent. Maybe. How do you decide on a location? That must be difficult in and of itself. A lot, lot, lot has to do with the lo location for the golf courses is the is the value of the property you're buying and if you can buy it. Plus you have plus you have some um, uh, different states, different laws, uh, wetlands, pine lands. Um, the state I live in right now is the worst state in the world to build anything, New Jersey. But it all depends on the on the on the price of the ground. Now, really? depending on the depending on the site you pick, do you envision holes as you're looking at the site, or is that something that comes afterwards? You just uh, without, the without, without question. In the keen eyes, taking a flat piece of ground and and molding it into a golf course is something that's a real special special um, uh, a job. Talent. And special talent. Right. Thank you. And you know, I think. For, a lot of our the great architects of the modern era, Fazio, Hans, um, uh, yeah, yeah, Cord and Crenshaw. They don't move. They don't move much ground, but I think they have fantastic eyes and can see can can vision it. I'm not. I'm. I'm not nearly their level at all. But who built Who built this Atlantic City Country Club, which your family is so fond of? Yeah, it was in our family almost 60 years. Um, it was it was first designed by Park Jr. in 97, Willie Park Jr., who came over to America quite quite often. I mean, considering he had to come on him, the Santa Maria. He designed Atlantic City, 12 holes, and with, with a fellow who, one of the original, who also had a piece of the um, design credits, a fellow who was original USGA, either not president, executive, John Reed. And then after Reed, Flynn, William Flynn, who's of the, the famous architectural and landscape firm, Toomey and Flynn out of Philadelphia, who did many, many courses around the Philadelphia area, including Huntington Valley. And, and he had a hand in Marion. He had a, and, um, a hand in Pine Valley, uh, Philmont, and of course, Atlantic City. 
And, so uh, in 1897, yeah. that's got to make it one of the oldest courses in the United States, yeah. no? I think we're in Atlantic City's in the top 12, 15, of course. St. Andrews allegedly up by you, up by the Yonkers. Yeah. Um, I'd say we're in the top 10 to 15. There's, you know, as as the years as, as the years go by, the, the facts, you know, <laughs> never never let the facts get in the way of a good story. And that's that's changed a lot because they've plowed what the secret is is the, the years that they're on the same property. Right. That they're on the same ground. To me, if you're talking the top 10 or 15, not something that was moved, like a, a course in Philadelphia, Ronimic started close to the city with great club. Now it's out in the, what they call the main line, Malvern, Berwyn. That wasn't on the same property. Time yeah. Country Club, same thing. They, they they moved not far, but they moved. Your dad, was it Leo that bought this club or was it some other member in your family? No, my the, the club... The club was owned for years by the hotel people, hotelmen, wealthy hotel in Atlantic City. They used it for relaxation for their customers and their guests. The, the hotels were starting with the Haddon Hall, which is now Resorts International, which really is run by the Mohegan Sun people. The, the owner of that hotel, which was called the Haddon Hall, and the ambassador, the train moor, um, they were the owners up until about 1946 or seven. The Hatton Hole. Why, that's, why would you change the name of that? That's a great name for a casino. Well, now, your dad, one of the things I was looking at, it's interesting, he was the president of the PGA. But what we know today, m most people think of the PGA. My knucklehead friends will think of the PGA Tour. They, right. And they think, oh, there's 29,000 or 27,000 pros in the PGA of America. Oh, that's right. They're hosting the Ryder Cup in a couple of weeks. But it was all the same thing back when your dad was the president. Take us through that and how yeah. your dad managed that whole process because it was splitting, right? Yeah, and we'll 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 maybe circle back on how my father became involved with Atlantic City Country Club because he had no money coming out of the war, but he had a job as working for those hotel people. But my father was a um long time gentleman in the golf business and and he forgot more than I'll ever know no and I don't think there's I can say it now he's been dead since 1986 very few people knew more about the golf business than Leo Frazier from the playing end if you're gonna if you're gonna put a a, a steamer in the kitchen or you're gonna buy a new mower very few people knew more than my dad and I'm and I can unequivocally say that but he got into the politics of golf. He was a local Philadelphia section. He was a local president for a lot of years, six or seven years. In fact, when he was president, they hosted the PGA at Haddon Hall in 1955, the, the national meeting. And worked his way up through the ranks, treasurer, secretary, and then during a very tumultuous time, 1968, 69, he was elected president. He was the right guy for the job at the time because A, he was an accomplished player. B, he also knew that that the, 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 the players are what people see. He understood how important it is as a um, to keep to keep the group together, but he was the one originally that thought that they, there should be a separate entity. The players should have their own say. It, it, it and and that took and and that and a lot of it he, from from when, when he was secretary, and that caused a lot of consternation among the other PGA officials. But wasn't uh, he friends with Nicholas and Palmer, oh, oh, and, oh, uh, oh. player, and all those guys on a personal level? So maybe. He, he got some input from those gentlemen? Without question. You're exactly right, Bob. Not necessarily player, because player went whatever. Player, be honest with you, went went along with mostly whatever Jack and Arnold wanted to do. But Arnold was the head, and, and our family goes way back with Arnold when he was in the Coast Guard in, in um, Cape May, which is about 40 minutes from where we I am right now in the Atlantic City area. And my father was friends with Deacon, and I'll make this short. 
deacon had called my father and said, listen, my kid's down there at the Coast Guard and he's going through uh, three months of training. Is there any way we can find him a place to hit some balls? And he and my father said, of course, he can come to Atlantic City. It's about a half an hour away. He said, I'll have him call you, but it won't be for a month. A month later, Palmer called and said, Mr. Frazier, I, I appreciate if I could come up. My father said I could come up to Atlantic City Country Club and hit some balls. But I have a problem. I don't, obviously, I don't have a car. I'll take a bus. He says, he says, no, you won't forget the bus. I'll come and get you. He drove down, picked him up, brought him up one weekend. He stayed at our house where I was a little kid. I was maybe three or four at the time. And he hit balls and my dad suited him up, had to fit, had to feet, got him some clothes because he always he had is the white gear. At Atlantic City Country Club, there's a picture of him swinging in his Coast Guard uniform. I've seen that picture, yeah. And and a long and a long illustrious friendship went went um went on from there with my father and Arnold. And um in the three part series in on the golf channel when Arnold was alive, which everybody saw, he spoke very highly of my father. In fact, Arnold's company built my golf course that I built in Florida in 2002. But their relationship was very, very good. And and make no mistake, the P, Arnold had Arnold had to say Jack was important, but Arnold had to say, and and he backed my dad. There were some long drawn out battles. If you go a little more of the history, my father gathered the top top guys like Arnold and Jack, of course, and Dan Sykes and Gardner Dickinson, some real and Frank Beard and Lionel and J. A. Bear, some real rebels, smart guys, in a in a hotel at the Miami Hotel at the airport. And they spent two and a half days there and they hashed it out. But I really believe if my father hadn't got them all together and had the relationship his relationship with Jack went 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 for, for years too, and Jack always appreciated my dad for one thing, is because when um, Jack had won a couple tournaments early on, and he had to be he had to be on the tour for six months or a year before he could be on the Ryder Cup. My father got that changed, so Jack could play in that first Ryder Cup that he was <laughs> eligible that before he was eligible under the old archaic rules. So there was a lot of symbiotic relationships between all three of them that a lot of people never knew but in both Jack and Arnold's book and Dean Beeman's too they can they both spoke highly of my dad there were some tough times talk, hold on a second let's talk about that change in the rule because it's a very important thing for this Ryder Cup that's coming up so you're saying that Nicholas had won some tournaments he hadn't quote unquote finished his apprentice time or whatever they called it back then such that he was eligible to be on the Ryder Cup team, right? And that was, you had to be there six months or longer? Uh, yeah, I don't know. These, I, yeah, I know it was a minimum six months. Okay, so let's fast forward to today. Luke Donald picked a young man named Ludwig Aberg. I thought the same. Your, same thing. And I'm going to tell you right now, I think Ludwig Aberg has a one in a hundred chance of being another Arnold Palmer. Here's why I think this. He was only a pro in June. He's had the social media channels cooking, just cooking on his behalf, getting him on this Ryder Cup. Look at Nicholas. He had won. It was a no-brainer. But this, this, and I think Luke Donald did it because he understands the upside this kid has, but he never would have made it back in those days. He's only been, what would you say, Billy, about 100 days he's been a PGA pro, maybe yeah. 120? Yeah. You so your dad was instrumental. Who? What was the decision about? The decision was about just the tour, or was it about the PGA? Pro? Was, the PGA had a lot of the PGA itself had a lot of um, power over the tour players. Okay, and they they felt that club pros shouldn't be controlling them, and they were right in a lot of ways. They were right in a lot of ways. Um. And I and you know it got down a little bit. It was it was also money. TV was just starting to come in there. They were getting a little bit of money, not unlike happened right recently, as we we've seen it with Live, how the money all of a sudden changed, and there are some people doing some audit, which which is, will be a lot more by the time these senators get done with it. But um, my father understood that of all the 
previous three or four executives, my father was the was the best player and had, and had actually a, a pretty darn good playing record. It was it would have been better if he hadn't been interrupted by World War II. Played in three or four majors, qualified for the British Open, but he understood that as um, as Al Barco said, they were the dancing girls. They were who people came to see. But in the end, they worked it out. The tour, and and I'll tell you something else. Joe Dye, who was one of the great USGA presidents, um, had retired, and my father because they had such deep friendship. And we had so much, and Atlantic City Country Club had so much history with the USGA. Three or four women's opens, mid-amateurs. Uh, the 01, the 01 amateur, by the way, that Billy, Billy, the Founds brothers both played in 01 in the amateur, in case you guys are wondering. The, the guys that built Oakmont played in the amateur here in 01, Atlantic City. But anyway, um. Ought one, as the old timers say. <laughs> but um, his line was, we hang together, we hang separately. <laughs> and in the end, in the end, it worked because clear has prevailed. Um, once again, I'll go back to what I kind of told you, Bob, that Nicholas and Palmer and player, but like I said, Gary went along with the crowd at the time. IMG was growing. There was plenty of places for Arnold and Jack to play around the world for way more money than they were making. And the offers were there. Not unlike Liv, they sure weren't going to go see a guy like Frank Peter, Dan Sykes, who, who, who getting an autograph from was like pulling teeth. I'm proud of my father. He, 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 it, was, it was a rough time and, and there was a lot of back and forth and nasty and arguments, not on, and, and, and rude things said. They need him of, today. He would be perfect today. Doug, uh, in our conversations, we talked about a couple of our favorite topics, gambling, horses. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to you and Billy. Uh, Billy found something while we were talking in our earlier section. I'll yeah. I, Billy. Go ahead, Billy. I found some pictures of the Atlantic City locker room, and the names are, are awesome. Arnold Palmer, Nucky Johnson, Willie Mays, Freddie Couples, Jim Thorpe. Leo Frazier, president of PGA 1969-1970, next to John McDermott. Then you got Julius Irving, John Daly. And then the last one is the one that intrigues me, Al Capone. Was Al yeah. Capone a member of Atlantic City Country Club? No, but as, as legend has it, it might be, it's more than a legend. And but this is- I'd like to open that locker. Way before my family, my family owned we owned it. But he um, was in Atlantic City a couple times as a guest of Nucky Johnson, having a if if you if you Nucky Johnson was the power broker in the Empire, right? Yeah, which was, which was you know fair, fairly accurate. The guy who wrote the book, as a matter of fact, Nelson Johnson, is a famous judge in the area, but also a great writer. He happens to be a good friend of mine, still alive. There was a poetic license in in the in the HBO series, but it was of good. Course. But anyway, uh, Capone liked to play golf, and Nucky had him over. Happened there whenever anybody's celebrities there, we put a name on a locker. But a lot of the a lot of that, the the John Dellies and the couples, after my family sold it in two thousand uh, to Caesars uh, Hotel and Casino, a lot of the they did a lot of player uh, outings and functions with. You know, the dailies and the couples and all that. Well, prior to those guys, wasn't Mickey Mantle a representative? Uh, yeah, yeah, of yeah. Mickey, absolutely. They did the same thing when we owned it. A couple of the, the president of Caesars, coincidentally, was a member of the club. And we were still a private club. Everything had to go through us. But we did some small private outings. And as you, to this day, they do the same thing the casinos where they bring in celebrities, whether it be a movie star, an athlete, usually an athlete, especially Super Bowl would be a, a football player. <clears throat> Around World Series time, it'd be a baseball player. But in all through the 90s, um, Mickey Mantle and Willie, who, by the way, Willie was a, is a lovely, lovely man. Mickey was a great guy until he got the booze in him. 
Yeah. I mean, it's a little tough, but they represented Bally's and they entertained and hobnob with their um, Bally's and Caesars with their high end customers. And they used our club as a, on occasion for some of those small outings, 40, 50, high, high limit, high, high um, net worth gamblers, big whales, they call them in the industry, as you know, um, Billy. And then Willie and, and Robert Knievel and Bobby Riggs, and I can go on and on and on, all were here in the 80s and 90s. Any good, any good gambling stories? We heard uh, uh, legendary John Birdman from Wingfoot talk about mm -hmm. Robert, we called him Evil Knievel, when he came to Wingfoot that one weekend. There were tens and tens of thousands of dollars uh, changing hand on those two days. And what's interesting but that uh, Birdman told us is they settled up after each hole. And the caddies held the money. So what do you recall about those gambling going on at the ACC uh, Country Club? We don't we don't have enough we don't have enough time for that. <laughs> but yeah, there you you name a rat contour or a character, and they came through our club. But you had to be a gentleman. And we're still a private club, and and some of the executives were were members, and we did a lot of business with them. But it was discreet. But I'll give you a quick one. George Lowe the the famous, the famous putter who taught Nicholas really how to putt and Arnold and made, and the, the George Lowe wizard, which was made by the Bristol golf company out of Georgia made a putter. And that's what Jack used for many, many of his victories. But George was an old friend of my father's and he was basically a bum of everything. He was a freeloader, but he was a character. I mean, he goes back to the, Titanic Thompson days and things uh -huh. like that. George would regale you with 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 numerous stories and some and most of them most of them were fairly true because one thing about George, he would um he 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 would take advantage of any situation he could, but he told some great stories. His father, by the way, was a pro at Baldershow. He grew up at Baldershow, never worked a day in his life, mooched off everybody. So, but my father felt sorry for him back in the mid eighties. And he said, we come in for a couple of weeks. Well, he came in for two weeks and stayed 13 years. We had, room, <laughs> we had rooms at Atlantic city country club and we gave him an old room. that was a storage room and he'd leave. He'd show up in about May after he moved from somebody else. He used to live a lot with, in the winter, he'd spend a month or so with Willie Shoemaker. Willie always gave him a place in one of the barns. <laughs> and George made a lot of money by hustling by his by his wits and selling his putters. You know, he he had a deal with Bristol; he could sell them right out of his trunk. And you know, I mean, especially after Nicholas started putting with it, wow! This one week, the celebrities are there, and 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 including Robert. Now we called him Robert because that's what he liked to be called, not evil. That was a press thing. But, you know, he was a wonderful guy. He had a little boozing problem early on. But, yeah, we called well, people that knew him called him Robert because that's what that's what he wanted. In other words, I would no way I'd ever walk up to him and say, hi, evil. He was an accomplished well, painter, had, had, a, had a great had a great um, relationship with my mother, who was also was an accomplished painter. And uh, like Tony, like Tony Bennett was, people, a lot of people don't realize what a great painter artist he was. And um, along with being a wonderful singer, well, Evil happened to be a daredevil, motorcycle, rocket guy, and was an accomplished artist. So this one couple days, um, and George was sitting in the pro shop looking who was who, and he knew everybody that came in, all the celebrities and hustlers and raconteurs. So they put a game together with Bobby Riggs, famous tennis player. I think he won the Open in 38 and 39. And and evil, but they had they, that was it was and I'll make it quick. It was after one of the the eighteen hole rounds that they were hobnobbing with some of the customers. They go out for nine holes. I know what the game was. I was there. It was it was for two thousand with thousand dollar presses, one down presses, and they played the front nine. Bob um, Bobby was about a nine, and evil was about a twelve maybe 11, but as it turned out, 
they off they go, off they go, and Eva wins three thousand. One couple presses, beat him pretty good. So Lowe had twenty percent of Evil's Evil's action. So he says, "Why don't we play tomorrow before the the celebrities and, and the guests would come, or the the guests would come, then came the next day for about eleven o'clock starting time? Why don't we play tomorrow, and um, we'll have another game?" They all like the idea. Seven thirty in the morning, limos show up. Robert and they get out. Now they're playing. Now they're going to play eighteen holes for the four thousand that 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 Bobby lost. I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And there was a few other people there. Bobby's playing right-handed. <laughs> but Robert didn't pick it up. I was the first one who picked it up. I saw him practicing on the on hitting balls on the range. But I didn't think anything of it until it's still standing on the first tee. He shot 74, won 6,000. He he was ambidextrous. He won it. He was in, and a good and a good solid eleven or twelve, ten to twelve left handed, right handed. He was a good five or six, right. Afterwards, now Lowe's steaming because he knows he got hu hustled. To hustle a guy like Lowe, one time is hard enough. Later they play with the they play with the um the customers. They'll go out for nine more. Bobby Riggs says to Robert, Robert, I'll give you a chance to get your money back. <laughs> I'll play his last words. Left-handed again, like I did yesterday for the first round. But you got I'll play you even, but you got to give me one free throw. He said, what? Well, I'll play you even. Instead of you having to give me three shots, I'll get one free throw a hole. So... Off they went. <laughs> well, Bobby Riggs could put it from 40, 50 yards within three, four, five, six feet of the hole. He shot two under. He beat him for another 3,000. The best thing is Lowe had 20% of evil the whole time. Maybe. And we loved Lowe losing. But the, the throws, the throws were unbelievable. He threw a, mostly right-handed, but a few left-handed. So he'd be 40 yards in the fairway and he would throw it onto the green and put it three feet. Oh yeah. Well, 40 yards that ah, was but but how about how about when the ball was in the lake? He had a free throw out of the lake. Uh, I saw him walk in a lake, <laughs> pick the ball up and throw it. <laughs> was, but but the 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 right hand, left hand, and and the free throw was one of the great hustles of all time. And it was talked about around there for years. There's a there's a moral of that story. When you're with a hustler like Bobby Riggs or Titanic Thompson, and you win the first time, it's just like winning in three card Monty. Walk yeah, away, run, run. run. sprint. Uh, uh, Rob Robert was a real pigeon, as you know what the pigeons are called. He's an easy mark, great guy. You know, most of the, as 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 luck would have it, most of the time when he jumped the founds at Caesars, he was jumping for Caesar's money because he had lost so much gambling, but a wonderful man, a nice guy. So let's so, shift right. to gambling uh, from gambling to horse gambling. You and Billy have a little something in common. Tell, tell Billy and me about your relationship with Shug McGahey, the famous horse trainer. I, I they don't know, call, but, you don't call him Claude, do you? Never have. <laughs> he's, he's the opposite of uh, Robert Knievel. Well, no, and, I don't think he, he doesn't mind Claude. I don't not like Robert. He doesn't like right. he's always been shook. Let, let me let me just jump back for two seconds. Atlantic City Racetrack was built in 1948, but about 1949, and my father was a small investor and he didn't have that much money. But Sinatra, Bob Hope, um, William Clay Ford, all were the, some of the investors in Atlantic City Racetrack. And um I used to park cars there once in a while when everybody wore coat and ties and women wear a dress every Saturday afternoon. But we'll go. Um, go ahead. We'll go to. We'll show, that, go to that, what a, that's what a whole other episode. Let's talk yeah. about horses. 
They used to have a great race at Atlantic City, the matchmaker. Yep, yep. They moved it to Monmouth. The best thing they ever had was a 1969 rock or 68 or 9 rock festival. Janis Joplin, uh, Jimi Hendrix, awesome. I mean, Shug had it just recently, you know, this last weekend, he had a pretty good weekend, Billy. Out of Kentucky Downs. Right. That's a crazy track. If there ever was a crazy track, that's it, man. They go up and down hills. It's not a circle. It's a or an oval. It's well, he's he's a he's a fine fine gentleman. One of our one of our great great trainers of all time. And Absolutely, got... and and a, and a sons and picture of integrity. Yeah, sons involved. But a pretty good player. Works hard on his game. I was a member for many years in Indian Creek in Miami. Miami Beach and played a lot with Shug. You know Dennis McCauley down there? Yeah, Dennis is a wonderful guy. Yeah. Shug's a, uh, I can't say enough nice things. You know, like all trainers, you don't get a whole lot of information. But no, he's uh, a little tight lipped about that stuff. But yeah. I'll tell you a story about Shug. I was at the Whitney several years ago and he invited me to his barn uh, earlier in the day. And he had a course named Honor Code running that day in the Whitney. And I said to Shug, you know, I'm looking at the field. I said, Shug, these are the best horses in training. You're not ducking anybody. And he said, I don't give a damn about them other horses. And to me, that was, oh, I, man. Folded up, I folded up the racing form, put it in my pocket. I don't need to look at this race again. And, and sure enough, he won uh, the Whitney. It was, a, it was a nice big day for me. Shug didn't know he gave me a tip, but. That's a huge tip for Shug. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What he what he has done for me, he says a couple of times that uh, he didn't work out very good this week or something like that. I know, yeah. <laughs> I know we had played together in the spring two or three times before he had Orb, and every time I asked him, he knew I was going to bet all his horses anyway. Yeah, anyway, he, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, I never going to bet him anyway, but he 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 did way back in March when we played golf. He liked Orb. And that was a wonderful Kentucky Derby win for him and his wife. That's you very know, happy. Orb loses if he gets hit by lightning. What are you betting on lightning? What do you, what do you like, lightning? <laughs> yeah, when I when I first uh, met Shug, uh, you know, I was rattling off the, all, all my memories of his horses and how far back I, I've been admiring him. And later that day, he introduced me to his wife. He said, uh, you know, this is Billy Regan. He knows more about our horses than we do. <laughs> That's it. I thought it was, you know, pretty funny. But he's he's a he's just a I wish everybody involved in horse racing was like Suge, uh, as far as honor and integrity and all the rest of that all combined into one. He's uh he's what makes horse racing great, guys like him. You're you're so right, Billy, and it's I and I, I enjoy hearing what you say about it because I feel I feel of course the same the same way. And um last year I was he was up at Monmouth, and um, I had texted him. I guess it was one of the big race days, and he happened to be there. And um, I texted him late and felt bad, but I brought some buddies about getting in the paddock area. Boom, got there, passes there, no questions asked, happy to do it. And um, what else are you going to say? He takes time for his friends. It's a good lesson. Yeah, for I saw him in the paddock at the uh, Belmont Stakes this year. So I had a word or two with him then, and you know, did you have the winner? I had the I had the winner ever ever since then, but not that day. I'm kicking myself still. And after I watched Archangelo win that race, I was like, I don't think he loses again in his career. I used to bet the whole card when an old buddy of mine played with the Baltimore Colts, Jimmy Orr, and um, especially the last year or two, he was sick. Jimmy was one of the all time great receivers who should have yeah, been in the Johnny league. Unitas. Yeah, he played with John. It was uh, Jimmy and I were very, very close. He spent his last bunch of years and lived in Brunswick. Pretty good, pretty good twelve handicap. We won the Brunswick member guest, but Jimmy and I always had we we bet the card twenty, but not nothing much, but just to keep him happy because he wasn't in good health. Twenty dollars a game, and 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 uh, Monday, Monday, Tuesday morning, he he had all the numbers. I think, and I'm not promoting it. But Billy Walters' book was pretty good. Gambler's Secrets from a Life at Risk. Is that the book? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, now, it's a small part about Mickelson, but Mickelson came up tiny, but everybody knows it. You know, yeah. I I mean, it, it, first of all, I know a lot, I know a lot of executives from Caesars talking talking about a real pigeon when it comes to 
the, the gambling was, I'm not talking golf, I'm talking about casinos. Well, football too. Who knows how much he would lost if it wasn't for Billy helping him. But but everybody in the casino business, and I still have a lot of friends in the business, some retired now, but some executives still around that he was an easy mark. Um, um, uh, an eight handicap blackjack player, not a good crap shooter. A real celebrity. You mentioned Arnold Palmer, Bob Hope, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin. What what do you remember, even as a little kid racing around, a celebrity that did you a nice that that you'll never forget that you want to pass on a story about a celebrity. My father didn't uh, knew Hope very very well. I, I and and I, I'll I'll just start, start and stop with Bob Hope in nineteen. 19- 27, 28, my father was a young assistant at Plum Hollow in Detroit. Um, Walter Hagen, who was from Detroit, uh, Rochester, really, but Detroit too, got him the job. How he got him the job, my dad caddied for him at Seabue in an exhibition in um, about 1923 or four. Hope was playing vaudeville and came over to, and was a young guy himself at the time and got into golf from living in California and um, came over to Plum Hollow. Somebody brought him over there and took a lesson from my father. They stayed friends to the day my father died, very good friends. And the letter he wrote to my mother in 1986 was, and, and his wife too, was one of the most beautiful handwritten letters you could ever imagine. And um, it was a friendship that was their friendship was very, very dear and very close. In fact, when they started Jupiter Hills in um, Florida, my father in a group with, with George Fazio, who was the architect, and Bill Clay Ford and Perry Como and Bob Hope, he was in the group too. Yeah, they were, you know, I, I, I if Hope, um, my dad went to Europe with him. Went to Europe with him on one of his tri- trips. He invited him over. It was the um, it was in the late fifties, the first time my dad had really been back since World War II. Hope was very good to him. He went to California. He would play golf with him at Lakeside, and when he came east, my father's lawyer also represented some of Hope's business in in New York, and they all three would would go to Pine Valley or Marion. Because the lawyer, a fellow named Francis Sullivan, who was a member of Indian Creek in Marion and Pine Valley, pretty pretty nice triumphant. Frank Frank Sullivan, the lawyer, along with representing Hope, he represented Ben Hogan against uh, Life Magazine, I guess Curtis Publishing, about when they had the suit about the five fundamentals. If you if you go look at that, you'll see so. That was a relationship my father had with Ben Hogan, with with well, we did with Hogan too, but with Bob Hope. I'm not saying they talked every week, but it lasted, you know, sixty, 60. plus years. Yep. And I and I wouldn't say that that they, it was more than a casual friendship. It was a very good. It was a very good friendship. That's Billy and I always talk about a friend. A friend is somebody who'll go pick up a friend. Your father picked up Arnold Palmer brought him over to pit falls at your place. You know, that to yeah. me is the ultimate in friendship. No, you're not going to take a bus. I'm coming to pick you up. And, yeah, and an airport over, one. Right? An airport then, one for a friend is that, you know, that's that's a tell-all. You guys got something special here. And um, and um, I certainly appreciate being a small part of it. Uh, let me put it this way. Can you find us a pigeon that the three of us can play with? Or should I find one? Okay, Ryder Cup picks. You got a Ryder Cup pick? Who's going to win, the European team and the U.S. team? Bet before they – I bet, Billy, I bet before they uh, even picked them. I bet the uh, – I bet the um, the Europeans. What, are you kidding me? So, Robert, when you look up in the old gambler's dictionary and it says action guys, Billy Hyman from Philadelphia was – Right up at the top. I played with him probably 30 times and caddy for him 20, 20, 25 times. One of the greatest amateurs of all time. But you're not going out there, even those days, with less than $25, $30, $40 Nassau with $10 skins and and putts. And and Billy was a true Sharpie. Billy lived at Palm Air 
not far from you guys. I, I'd like two dollars for every night in his life he spent at the Pompano betting the horses, and he had he had a cadre of bookmakers. Wow! See then, no sports betting now. But Billy was a true sharpie. The country club all through the fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, and nineties called the James Sonny Frazier Memorial. It was my father's brother who died in nineteen fifty. Was a great amateur player. Had all, by the time he was 35, died of Hodgkin's disease. He had already played in four or five amateurs, a couple opens. Was a businessman, my father's younger brother. So we did. It was held on September 20th, 21st, and 22nd in 1946, according to a program I'm looking at the yeah. James Sonny Fraser Trophy Tournament. Right. It was Memorial after he died in 50. Look, did you check the winners there? I didn't see the winners. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple names. Carrie Middle, amateurs now. Carrie Middlecoff, Billy Hyman, Julius Boros. How's wow. that? All right, real quick. So Billy Hyman's playing in an open. Now you have to, they line up the, the players by the alphabetically Hogan, H O, Hyman, right? Billy Hyman's sitting on the bench. Hogan comes over, sits five feet from him. Now he had played with him. Half a dozen times before that. Never said a word to him. Hi, Billy. I never said a word. I never said hello to him unless he said hello to me. I was scared shitless of him. He's he, so I'm I'm sitting six, seven feet from him. Joe Dye comes in, maybe it was 54, 55. He said, Bill, for the first two rounds, you have to play with an amateur. And Hogan looked at him and says, Didn't you change that effing rule yet? He said, no, 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 Ben, you have to play with an amateur. So he says, well, here, he said, give me the list. Gives him the list. He looks down. He looks at, now, Billy's right six feet from him. <laughs> he said, well, you got to give me a fucking amateur. Give me the, that, that tall kid, Hyman. At least he can play a little bit. <laughs> Billy funny. and I always talk about a friend. A friend is somebody who will go pick up a friend. You guys got something special here. I certainly appreciate being a small part of it. Deacon had called my father and said, listen, my kid's down there at the Coast Guard and he's going through uh, three months of training. Is there any way we can find him a place to hit some balls? And he and my father said, of course, he can come to Atlantic City. It's about a half an hour away. He said, I'll have him call you, but it won't be for a month. A month later, Palmer calls and said, Mr. Frazier, I, I appreciate if I could come up. To, my father said I could come up to Atlantic City Country Club and hit some balls. But I have a problem. I don't, obviously, I don't have a car. I'll take a bus. He says, he says, no, you won't. Forget the bus. I'll come and get you. Brought him up one weekend. He stayed at our house where I was a little kid. I was maybe three or four at the time. And he hit balls and... My dad suited him up, had to fit, had to feet, got him some clothes because he all he had is the white gear. At Atlantic City Country Club, there's a picture of him swinging in his Coast Guard uniform. I've seen that picture. Yeah. Thanks for joining Billy us Casper, today, Billy Horner. We really appreciate your Double feedback. Double indemnity. And please Marky. subscribe to the Two show Adder. and hit Claude the bell Harmon. icon so you get notified. Movie classics. Of new episodes. Mark Gable. Hit him hard. Job. And hit them off. That's 36 holes.